Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast with me, Christian Harris. Today we're talking about the risk of sound, not just noise, with my guest Stephen Wheatley. Now you're probably all too familiar with the risk of noise, but what about sound? Why is that such a big risk? Why is it kind of a hidden risk? And why is it something that we should all be doing more about? And how can we do so? That's the topic of today's discussion. I hope you enjoy it, but one quick note, don't have your headphones on too loud. Cheers. Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast with Christian Harris. We believe that proactive safety and risk management powers business performance. Each week we explore this theme, sharing guests, stories, insights, trends, hints and tips. You can find us on all the major podcasting platforms and video versions are available on YouTube. But for now, let's join the conversation with Christian. Okay, welcome everybody to this session. We're just going to let people start filtering into the Zoom room. Uh, If you are uh, joining us on one of the live streams, welcome. Um, Thank you for joining this session today, this safety roundtable session uh, about the noise, sorry, the noise, the risk of uh, sound, not just noise. Um, We're going to just let some more people join and then we will get started. And I'm I'm just going to double check on my phone, multitasking, that um, everything is going as it should. And it looks as if it is perfect. Everything seems to be working, so that's always a bonus. Good stuff. So uh, let's get started. We're here today on the Safety Roundtable, uh, and the topic is Sounds Risky. Uh, So we're going to be talking about the risk of sound, not just noise. Um, If you don't know, the Safety Roundtable, if it's your first time, uh, the Safety Roundtable is a fortnightly Zoom session where a bunch of us hop on to Zoom and have a chat about a different topic each time related to safety and risk. Uh, Sometimes it's just me hosting and introducing a topic. Uh, Sometimes, like today, we have a special guest uh, to discuss the topic with me. And then it's always, always, always opened up to questions and thoughts and comments and insights from everybody taking part. So if you are joining us on a live stream of this, then I really recommend following the link, which will be in the um, whatever platform in the notes uh, that that you're watching this on uh, and joining the Zoom, because then you can kind of really get involved in the interactivity side of things. So with that said, um, I will stop sharing and uh, love to um, say hello to you, Stephen, and welcome you to the session today. And and perhaps you could start just by giving a bit of background, a bit of context on why it is we're talking about this and and what you um, are doing in this in this area. Yes, thank you. First of all, uh, Christian, thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk today. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you. Um, just as sort of, if you like, a bit of disclosure and a bit of background on me, if you like, um, I've got a number of hats. Some of them are pro bono and some of them are uh, we make a living out of. So let's start with the making a living. So I'm a uh, founder and CEO of a business called Limiteer Hear Angel. We have spent the last 14 years or so safeguarding the hearing of people who wear headphones, whether they're wearing them at work or whether they're wearing them recreationally. When we're at work, we're generally using wired headphones and we have a dongle which we supply that uh, safeguards in line with the noise at work regulations. Um, And out of work in the recreational space, um, we are looking at a a wireless firmware, a firmware that's in wireless headphones that gives users information about their exposure, like a Fitbit for your ears. So that's the that's the day job, if you like. But I, for a number of reasons, uh, I've managed to acquire a number of uh, pro bono um, responsibilities, which I'm, I'm very pleased about. And uh, they're all in the same space. So the first thing is I'm a member of the World Health Organization's World Hearing Forum, which is seeking to um, work and focus on 
avoidable causes of hearing loss. So that's what its uh, overarching ambition is. You know, we're not dealing with those sad people or those unfortunate people who have uh, different hearing when they're born. We're talking about people who are normal hearers and make enabling them to conserve their their hearing throughout their life. Um, so that's the World Hearing Forum. As a result of that, I'm also a member of the World uh, Health Organization ITU Safety Standards Committee, which has written some new safety standards for recreational headphones. Um, so if any of you happen to use um, Apple uh, headphones or Sony headphones, probably more importantly, um, you'll find that they now include some hearing safeguarding features and they're in line with the guidelines uh, of the ITU WHO. Um, I'm also involved with the Make Listening Safe campaign, which is hence why this logo is behind me today. Um, the Make Listening Safe campaign is a global campaign. It's going to be piloted in the UK and it's going to be launched on November the 1st at an in-person event in London. Um, there are some tickets available. If you're interested, please come back to me. I'm also a founder and trustee of the UK Hearing Conservation Association. Um, and yeah, that does exactly what it says on the tin. And there may even be some members of the UK HCA here with us today. So sorry, that's a bit of a long gallop, I'm afraid. But uh, the, oh, the disclosure is done, Christian, and I hope everybody understands where I'm coming from. No, that's all right. It's uh, it's useful to know the context um, so that people can kind of uh, see uh, see where you're coming from or, uh, or should I say hear where you're coming from in the context of uh, of this discussion. So let, let's start at the top then. Um, in the title of this event, we talked about the risk of sound versus noise. So perhaps we could just start by defining, you know, what is sound versus noise? What's the difference? Um, in what context should we be thinking about each of those things? OK, no, it's a very good point. It's something we spend quite a lot of time uh, talking to people about. So uh, in the, the basically sound comes in two forms. One is noise. And generally, we define noise as sound you don't want. So it sounds th this particular meeting is nice and quiet. I can't hear any background noise. So that's great because then the sound, which I hope is you being able to concentrate and hear my voice, is clear. So noise is sound you don't want. Sound is sound you do want. So let me give you some examples. If, for example, you were a commentator or a cameraman uh, in an outside broadcast situation, you will probably have quite a lot of noise around you. And depending on how you're listening to your instructions from your cameraman or the producer, you may have over ear headphones on or in ear monitors in or something like that. And that's the sound you want to hear but that sound has to compete with the noise that you're in. So there is an example where we would have to consider both the noise and the sound uh, as part of the exposure uh, levels for the individual. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that does make sense. And in your experience, um, to what extent are people focusing on sound versus noise? That's a very good question. Um, and, and please interrupt if, this, if, if you wish. Um, so I think if we go back, the, the, the sort of the regulations we have are based on the noise at work regulations 2005. And I think as an overview, and this is fairly generalized, there will be some outlying cases here. But if you if you or I or indeed any of the audience walked into a factory that was bashing metal or a quarry where they're breaking rock or a construction site, we would be quite surprised, I think, to find somebody on that site without hearing safeguarding. Um, so, yeah, they'll be wearing ear defenders. Just think of common things like being on an airport ap apron. So when you walk out to the... Uh, hello? Hello? <laughs> hello? Who's that? Um, when you walk out to an aircraft on the on the runway, uh, when you're going on holiday, just look around you, you'll see everybody there is wearing um, wearing hearing safeguard. They'll be wearing over ear, ear defenders or the like. So I think we could probably say generally that the HSE has done a very good job of supervising, encouraging, inspecting um, the noisier environments. Remember, noisy sound you don't want. But let's think about the sound issue. So 
there are lots of situations. There are people who have to listen to sound at work. I mentioned one earlier, you know, sort of the, the people in the broadcast or media sector who are on outside broadcast. They they have to contend with noise, but they they are keen to hear sound. So uh, I'm sorry to use the sort of sporting analogy, but you know, there's a there's a penalty about to be taken. The director's about to rewind the video, and he says it's going to go in one, two, three, and he wants the commentator to opine on on that. You've got a really noisy environment, probably without any hearing protection on uh, well over 100 dB. But some of that will be diminished by the fact you've got headphones on. But you can still be into the into the very high 90s, early hundreds of the combined sound and noise environment. So um, it, it's an interesting question that uh, I've done a little bit of work on recently. So if you were if you are a manufacturer or a quarry or a construction site, you are probably going to be regulated and inspected by the HSE. And from what I understand, they have something under a thousand inspectors to cover the whole of the country. That was the information I was given when I spoke to them the other day. Yeah. If you're in a, an administrative environment, so you might be in an office, um, you know, no. an open plan office environment, you know, wearing headphones. We, we, I'm looking around this audience and I'm seeing people wearing headphones in this audience. What is your exposure level at this time? And the, the thing is that your handset can produce quite easily 100 decibels. So if you produce uh, speech at 100 decibels, you can probably listen for somewhere around about 25 to 35 minutes a day. But we're not taking that seriously. So I think what we've got is we've got a situation where there are people at work who are now well protected against noise and so they should be i think that there's a much bigger risk in the future as as there are many many more times the number of people in manufacturing and construction are sitting in offices as we speak or sitting in coffee shops or sitting at home wearing headphones and and i don't think that has been taken seriously yeah there's a regulatory piece about that as well is that that falls outside of the HSE's direct requirement. It, while the HSE is responsible for all regulations, it's an environmental health officer who would be the person that would highlight that risk. Um, and I think they've got a difficult job. You know, they come into a, an office building or an uh, administrative fa facility and they've, they've probably got 20 or 30 things they need to have a look at. Yeah. And they haven't seen in the past headphone use in open plan offices as a particular issue and i think we need to try and help uh, raise the uh, issue with them so that they at least become aware of it and start to look at it yeah and and, and this was one of the things that i was um, that, that drove me to be keen to have this conversation because there's quite an interesting analogy with my field of slips isn't there where you know, it's something that affects huge amounts of people. It's the biggest cause of um, people going to A&E, for example. Uh, yeah. But yet it's kind of where where do we look at that on the spectrum of, you know, this, this high uh, volume uh, of potentially sort of low um, perceived risk versus the, the high risk of, you know, a fall from height or something, but a low volume. And I think we, you know, generally speaking, are doing pretty well uh, this kind of end but but less yeah. well at, at this end so yeah that, that was kind of why I was interested to, to kind I, of I think this. I think that 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 so it's not an uncommon problem I mean if the whole thing if the HSE had 25,000 inspectors and was responsible for all both the industrial environments and the commercial environments I think we would probably have a different um a different issue because you would you would you would talk to the HSE and they would they would make sure their inspectors were aware of it so interestingly in the field of slips um the hc were at the iosh food and drink conference a couple of weeks ago uh, and they were saying this is second hand information because i wasn't there but several people have contacted me afterwards that they were saying you know we're seeing a rise in slip strips and falls and we're not really sure what's driving it and we need some help to kind of better understand it so um you know i think there are there are always opportunities to uh, to try and help them to um, address different things and perhaps to change their 
approach and their focus in in, in some way so you know raising mm. awareness by by events like this are uh it, it's hopefully something that um that would be helpful in that regard yeah um was there any uh, i mean that's it's probably a difficult question to ask, answer is it is there an increase in slips and trips or is it increase in reporting of slips and trips because i think that's another issue isn't it that you know yeah well um the the HSE would be basing it on RIDOR data, so the more serious injury data. So they would see yeah. an, up, an uptick in the number of injuries caused by uh, by slips and trips. Uh, that there's a massive um, under-reporting issue in slips, trips, and falls, just as there is, I suspect, based on what you're saying, in in the the risk of of sound because yeah. people people um, are not looking for it. They don't know how to define it. Um, they don't really understand that it is a risk, etc. Yeah, I think that just reflecting on that, you know, if if when you had had an excessive uh, dose of sound, you had some product of that. I don't want to give you a ghastly image, but if your ears bled, for example, horrible example. See, when when somebody slips or trips, there's a there's a consequence, isn't there? And the consequence is they perhaps may have an injury or something. And you know, I don't wish that on anybody. But the th the problem with sound is you can damage your hearing and not know about it for a considerable amount of time. A um, couple of things uh, that I'd like to sort of put in the mix here. Um, there's some research been done at Manchester University about sound. The problem with sound is your exposure doesn't become evidently damaging for a considerable amount of time. It's cumulative over time. And there is very little evidence in the early stages of the harm you've done that you've done harm. If that does that make sense? You know, I suppose a bit like cigarette smoking. I'm not encouraging people to do that, by the way. But a few fags probably isn't going to hurt you. What hurts you is having 30 fags every day for the rest of your life. That's what's going to hurt you at some point, inevitably. Um, yeah. So the fact is, the fact is that you are doing harm to your hearing, but you're not aware that you're doing harm to your hearing, if that oh. makes sense. And um, some research, as I say, from Manchester said, Manchester University, MANCAD, um, suggests that you can lose up to 50 or 60 percent of the hair cells in your ears before you can discern that you've got a hearing problem you've already done 50 to 60 percent of the damage so one of the issues there is and then and this is moving towards what you can do about it um one of the issues there is if you go and have a pure tone or the audiometry test it won't detect that damage until it's too late mm. and you know you've already lost 50 percent of your hearing in that frequency by the time you notice it um, and there are some new tests which are being promoted which are auto acoustic emissions which audiometry tests are, are subjective you're put in a booth and you'll get subjected to tones and you're asked whether you can hear a sound or a number or whatever it happens to be so that's very subjective. It's the user who's responding. The OTC tests are the same ones they use on newborn children. So it's not a, it's not subjective. It's objective. It's the instrument that does the testing, and it doesn't rely obviously because the child's not sentient at that point. Um, you know, they're not able to say yes or no. <laughs> you know, they they the, the, the resonance actually determines what the um, um what their child's hearing is so yeah. there's there's quite a number of things in this really and and the issue is that we basically had one pair of ears mm. and you know if you use headphones say on the way to work on the tube and then you sit in an open plan office for six hours you know using your headphones for isolation or for to help you concentrate that's a very significant amount of exposure that you could have in that period of time so Mm -hmm. so there's obviously awareness to be raised um and potentially some more to be done from a sort of hse perspective or, or at least some discussions around hse eho etc um what can we do about this problem uh but it is interesting that uh the who has cottoned on to this and is doing some stuff about it. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? And it's doing it in some yeah. interesting and in some interesting areas, isn't it, around gaming? Yes. And no, absolutely. Things, yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, 
again, uh, some of I'm sure some of the audience is aware that the WHO conducted research um, in 2014 and published in 2015, and the report. Uh, and if you want to go and look at it, it's called 1.1 billion people at risk of avoidable hearing loss. Um, so uh, if you think about it, world population is what is about 7 billion people, something like that. Um, uh, and this is 2015. And so one in six or so of the world's population is at risk of avoidable hearing loss. Go back to what we said right at, back at the beginning. Um, we're not here talking about those people who have uh, hearing disadvantage at birth or those people who get uh, hearing loss through ototoxicity through uh, certain treatments for cancers and things like that. We're talking about normal ja Jan John or Joan on the Clapham Omnibus, the standard normal hearer. 1.1 billion of them are at risk of hearing loss and that was between 12 and 35 years of age. So it's probably a bigger group than that. They've recently redone this research. They're now forecasting by 2050 that it'll be 2.5 billion people at risk of avoidable hearing loss. Wow. The, the, the two issues there, one, the population of the world's grown and is growing rapidly, as you're probably aware, and it'll be 10 billion by uh, 2050. Um, but also the ubiquity of things like headphones. You know, we've gone... The, the world has changed so much, you know, and since if, if you can cast your mind back pre COVID, um, you know, the, the world has changed so much. We're much more into video conferencing. We're much more into working from home. Um, we're much more into individual entertainment. Um, so, um, and all of those things require us to have sound systems or, or headphones. OK, so World Health Organization identified this. Then then they said, well, what can we do about it? And so what they've done is they've done a number of things and um, I'm, I've been involved in it and I'm, I'm quite support, I'm very supportive of it. So the first thing that they did was they came up with some safety standards for venues. Now, the, the biggest single risk to hearing is probably headphone use. That's not because headphones themselves are more dangerous than going to uh, live events, whether that's sporting or music. They're just it's just the ubiquity of them. You know, you're looking around this audience, they're probably a third or maybe a half the people have got headphones on, you know, and I would have them on normally, uh, you know, at this time. So um, so the first thing that they've done is they said, let's look at live events. And they've issued some standards for live event venues to do with things like normalizing the sound level throughout the venue. As a much, much younger person, I went to see ACDC once in a in a um, sports hall at a university and I stood at the back and I probably was about 75 metres away. And I, it was absolutely unbearable at the back. Goodness only knows how loud it was at the front. I recently had the privilege of going to see a concert at Hyde Park where they had curved array speakers, which meant that the people at the front were getting the sound from the speakers directly above them. So it could be tuned for them. And then as and then if you're right at the back, you're getting the sound from here. So they could m make the sound floor much more even throughout the venue, providing people with uh, useful um, and effective hearing safeguarding if they want it. So rather than just squidgy foam plugs. Um, so that, that and on a side issue, I've just been to the launch of the Nighttime Industry Association's campaign called Listen for Life, which picks up on the make the key points that we're working on with the make this and save campaign so the, the second part of the, what the who did was they then got together with the itu which is a, another part of the world of the united nations and they have cr created some safety standards for recreational headphones and those safety standards to their credit have been adopted by apple sony and uh pixel and will be adopted by the regulator for Europe sometime in the next 12 to 18 months. So headphones that you buy in Europe will actually start to provide you with information. So that's another big thing that they've done. Um, the other thing that they have done is to create the Safe Listening Alliance, which is a this product complies campaign, if you like. So if you see the product with a sticker on it that says it's Safe Listening Alliance, that product provides uh, features which are in line with the World Health Organization standard. And then finally, 
um, they have catalyzed the Make Listening Safe campaign globally. So as you're possibly aware, WHO has 194 contributing countries. The UK is the pilot for the whole of the world and we're launching in the beginning of November. And our focus um, at the beginning of November is to increase the awareness of the risks of avoidable hearing damage in those between 10 and 40 years of age, and specifically the first campaign, so as not to compete with the Nighttime Industries campaign, is focused on headphones. So we're gonna deal with headphones, Nighttime industry at this moment are going to deal with live events. So that's what the WHO are doing. Um, interestingly, on the Nighttime Industries Association, I was chatting with one of their uh, directors, um, and they don't feel that the, the Nighttime Industry Association venues, so the clubs, pubs, and even big venues are policed well. They, they don't, they, they're aware of the regulations, but they're not aware of any compulsion to adopt them. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. So, so that's yeah. what the World Health Organization is up to. And, and, and frankly, that's what I'm up to for the next week or two is to get <laughs> this launched. And if, if any of the audience would like more information on it, please do um, look us up. Uh, so there is, there is a Make Listening Safe campaign dot com website. Yeah. Please you know, go and have a look at it. Follow us on uh, LinkedIn. We're also on Twitter and, and other social media platforms are available. Yeah. Perfect. No, definitely encourage people to to do that. We, um, and we'd love to have them on board. This is a coalition of the willing mm. and, and we will have a greater effect. And it's not a once off. We, you know, we'll we'll kick this one off. This first campaign is probably going to be six or eight months. And then we'll we'll pivot to something else, to, to, to one of the other um, risks to hearing. So, yeah, perfect. So um, let, let's pick up on this headphones point then, because um, I, I I've got my headphones on now um which i always do when i'm doing a, a podcast for whatever reason but i suppose i d don't need to i could just have um the sound coming out of my computer would that be sort of safer from the perspective of you know a, a prolonged exposure if i was doing a an all day um you know zoom um conference or something would i would it be better to have the noise or the sound sorry coming out of the computer rather than through headphones OK, well, it depends. You, you, you accidentally led me into a very good point, really, which is, um, first of all, try and get the noise in the environment you're in under control. So um, let me so I'm not wearing mine at the moment because my office, fortunately, is very quiet, but I have a pair of noise cancelling headphones. So yeah, which is what these um, are as well. Yeah. Right. Good. And, and hopefully the noise is activated. I can't hear any background noise where you are, Christian. No, so really I'm, I'm assuming. So so that's all good. So the first thing is try and get your your the noise that you are being subjected to under control, either by moving away from it or by using noise cancelling headphones. So a couple of a couple of things. Firstly, if you ever want to listen to anything on the underground or on a train, get some noise cancelling headphones really if that's the only thing anybody takes away from this that will help you because what it does is here's the noise level and you want to hear the sound which is the content you want to hear so it's a podcast or watch a film or whatever you need to have between eight and ten decibels of clear level above the residual noise to be able to hear clearly without that you're not going to hear clearly so I'll give you uh, an example in um, on the tube. I live in North London. So on the Northern line, the, the ambient noise is in the early to mid 90s. So if you're there with your earbuds in on the Northern line on the tube and you're listening to something, the chances are you've got the volume flat out on your phone. That's 100 dB. The safe listening level, it depends. If you listen to electronic dance music, it really isn't very long at all. It's about... 20 minutes, something of that order. If it's speech, it's a bit longer because speech contains a little less energy. So noise cancelling headphones, damn good idea. Second question is, Chris, Christian, if you were, you're one of, uh, you're, I'll give you an example. We, we uh, did some work in an advertising agency, has uh, three floors, 200 people in each floor, open plan office. About half of the people on each floor were wearing headphones. We did some quick and dirty conversations with the people there 
and we came across a young woman who lived down in Croydon. She was commuting up on the overground to Victoria and then getting the tube to the office. And she listened all of that time, which took about an hour and 10 minutes or so. She listened the entire time to music on her on her headphones. She had probably had twice the dose level that she would have been permitted at work before she even got to work. She then sat at her desk and her headphones were so loud, she was probably going to get between four and six times what she would have been permitted to listen to at work. She then caught the train home. And when she went home, she then went to the pub, which was also noisy. So this poor woman's exposure levels were probably eight or ten times what you would ideally want them to be. Now, you can say, well, only a part of that is down to the employer. Well, yes, it is. So as an employer, if I had people in my office wearing headphones, I would be making sure that those headphones were regulated so that we didn't give them excess dose. And that that would be that would be uh, the, the point there is, well, I'm really sorry, Joan or June or whatever this young lady was called. Um, very unlikely name for a young lady, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, I'm really, we were really sorry that you've lost, you've damaged your hearing, but you didn't damage it while you were at work, mm. and therefore it's not down to us. Um, so um, the World Health Organization's plans are to to make all headphone users aware of the risks. So it's not just focused on recreational headphone use; it's focused on recreational and occupational. And I suspect some people will be going to their employers and saying. I'm working in this contact centre with a pair of headphones on all day. Uh, what can I do to or, or what are you supposed to do to look after my hearing? So I think probably I would recommend if I was, uh, you know, if I had people in my company who are wearing headphones, I'd be looking at how can I safeguard their hearing, but also safeguard the company's liabilities um, over, over the future. And, yeah. you know, to conclude on that, you know, we have one pair of ears. I don't have a pair of ears I wear only for work. No. And we need, the employers need to take responsibility for the exposure during work. Mm. And if you listen to my advice I've given many times uh, on how to be good at safety, um, it's to use both ears and one mouth in that ratio. So you're doing a lot of listening. So you definitely want to protect your ears uh, in this uh, in this space. Um, yeah. Okay, that's, that's helpful. Um, yeah, that's very helpful advice. Um, so one of the things, uh, and by the way, I'm going to start opening this up to questions from uh, everybody. So do, um, if you want, if you're on the Zoom and you want to ask a question, just go into reactions, raise your hand, and then I'll call you uh, to unmute and, and you can ask us uh, a question uh, or um, type it in the chat. And if, if you're watching this on the stream anyway, you can always type into the chat as well, and I'll do my best to pick up on those. But uh the, the only way to guarantee having your question answered uh, is to uh, raise your hand and then come in and, and chat to us because uh, I'm definitely on the lookout for those for those things. Um, so one of the things that when we had our sort of initial chat about this really struck me was the link between hearing and cognitive decline. Could you give us a bit of an overview on on some of that? Um, yeah. data because that that to me was really really fascinating yeah no thank you for reminding me of that um you, know, you can see it's quite a broad topic and, the, and the, i think we need to take it very seriously um so uh the lancet published an article a year or two ago that said that maintaining good quality hearing is probably the biggest modifiable factor that you can do to avoid cognitive decline so there's been some work done and there's a uh, an academic in Southampton, she was at Liverpool, called Dahlia Simpida, who's doing who's right at the front end of this type of research. And what she did was she looked at a group of people who had hearing loss and then normalised it for the population. And she was horrified that those people with hearing loss also had a higher representation of cognitive decline. She then looked at a group of people with cognitive decline uh, issues, all tested, and normalised that group. And a much higher percentage than average have hearing loss. So there is a strong 
uh, and we need to be careful here because this is right at the front of um, medical research. There's a strong correlation between hearing loss and cognitive decline. So if you want to avoid it, and, and I, I'm sure in an audience of this size, we've got uh, all sorts of people who've experienced it. Um, tragically, my mother-in-law had it and I saw what it did to my wife. Um, cognitive decline is a wicked, wicked thing uh, to happen to anybody. Um, yeah. And, you know, it is, hey, look, you know, as long if, 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 as if losing your hearing wasn't scary enough, the idea that it might accelerate some sort of cognitive decline. The other thing as well, I suspect, is we're seeing an increases in early onset in these areas. And I'm wondering whether that is because we're seeing people who've damaged their hearing much sooner than they would have done, say, 40 or 50 years ago. Mm. And, you know, so we're, we're, we're seeing people in their 40s and 50s, uh, we've been told about them by audiologists. And these people have got hearing that's more typical of people in their 70s or 80s. Yeah. Than, than than 40s or 50s mm. and what effect that has on cognitive function is a is a, a big concern yeah. so yeah not not only is it isolating uh unpleasant um having hearing loss but it you know if it, it starts to lead to um, cognitive decline I, th I think that's a you know that's certainly going to increase its um its uh appreciation and ser of ser how serious it is so yeah yeah no absolutely so you've given uh some advice on headphones um both from a personal and a, a business perspective but looking sort of taking a step back from just that kind of headphone issue into this topic of sound risk more broadly um what would be some of the advice on things that um people in the audience could be doing both from a sort of business perspective but also from a personal uh, perspective as well yeah i think um that's still so the personal one is um if you're going to let's say you're going to a live event let's say you, I, and i sometimes go to the o2 for example um and it's a you know it's probably an hour and a quarter on the on the tube to get down there don't spend that hour and a quarter with headphones in blasting your ears possibly take your noise cancelling headphones put the noise cancelling element on and then maybe listen to a podcast because human speech is is quite good for you it's what we're designed for so i i would think about those sort of things and i don't want to be a party pooper i'm not saying don't do things i'm just saying be cognitive of it you're going to go to the o2 you're going to i don't know uh, the police I, mean, I went to see the police and the o2 um yeah and and they were absolutely fantastic and it was two two hours flash to bang absolutely brilliant but don't overload your ears before you get there and don't overload them on the way home you know think about the environment you're going to you know if you're going to go to a football match that's probably two and a half three hours of exposure in 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 that period again very noisy environments don't wear your headphones on the way there unless it's for the noise cancelling functionality um i think that the um i think from a work point of view i think if i was a uh an hr director i would be quite concerned if i walked into one of my open plan offices and i saw a lot of people wearing headphones i'd be very concerned that we have a responsibility we've given them permission to do that okay so they don't necessarily have to have the headphones on for their work function but we've actually there is a there is a potential liability on my company because we have permitted those people to wear headphones in the in our environment and we haven't done anything to to help mitigate any risk so i think um if i was a if i was an hr director or i was a company health and safety guy i'd be thinking about do i have a risk of people using headphones either for for work tasks or being permitted to use them uh, for they'll say for concentration but you know at which point you have no control over them you know they're connected to their computer the headphones can output 102 105 db depending on what you're driving them with you know as well as i do that is massively over the exposure levels and if they lose their hearing and you haven't done anything they could come back to you and say do you know what i think you made me deaf and the employer needs to be able to say firmly i'm really sorry we didn't 
you know, we took all these steps and, and you, you we're sorry you're deaf, but we you didn't get it here, if you like. So those are the sorts of things. Um, and then if you're doing anything. So I'm, I, my problem is I've got 8000 hertz tinnitus. My hearing is 20 years older than I am. And I've got a notch in this ear because I used to shoot clay pigeons. OK, and I'm left handed. So my ear points at the gun. Yeah. And nobody said to me, you need to wear hearing protection. Hmm. So I've got a notch in this ear. So this ear is a lot worse than this one. And I'm notching this ear because of that. Hmm. So think about it. And I go to uh, motorcycle racing and things like that. I ride a motorbike. I wear earplugs when I ride my motorbike. So there's all sorts of things you can do. So given the chance, protect them. Don't overload them and look after yeah. them. You've only got yeah. one pair. When they're damaged, they're damaged and it's gone. Yeah, no, some, some sound uh, sound advice there. Um, Mike, you've got your hand up. Uh, do you want to unmute and uh, don't shout too loud because I've got headphones on, but ask your question. I will try. Certainly, uh, Mark Light raced at first tour in the chat as well. And uh, I think Rosemary also echoed that it's a really good question. So it's something has been bothering me. It's about with these um, headphones and hearing protection in general, how do you deal with people who have got to wear hearing aids already? Um, how do you manage those sort of people? Thank you for your question. That's a very good question. Um, I'll tell you how you don't do it, and then I'll tell you how you do do it. So uh, I we did a lot of tests with broadcasters. We're a, uh, we're a supplier for the BBC, so we did a lot of tests with them. And we turned up at a football match, Premier League football match, and I saw a footballer who most of you would know, who is now a commentator, take his hearing aids out and put his headphones on. That isn't how you do it. When he was actually at the commentary position, we were able to monitor his level. I could not put the headphones on my head. They were so loud and so painful. The HSE guidance is that the, the person who has impaired hearing should take steps to restore their hearing to as normal a level as possible and then be treated as a normal hearer. Now, whether that's technically possible, because I'm not a hearing aid expert, but I'm, you know, and I don't, you know, I don't know what sort of technologies are in the hearing aids, but that is what I'm told they're supposed to do. So, um, yeah, so they they should be they should do what they can to restore their hearing. The other thing to remember is a hearing aid. So I wear spectacles, which, as you can see, and um, that kind of restores my sight to what it was like maybe 20 years ago. Unfortunately, what hearing aids do is you have your audiology test and they say you can't hear in this frequency and what the hearing aid does is it amplifies that frequency or if you have very little uh, reception in that frequency it moves it to an adjacent frequency so it's a bit like having spectacles that emphasize a particular color now if you like music and you're an aficionado that's going to sound very very odd so hearing aids are essential because they may help you avoid cognitive decline, but they're not going to put you back in the position you were in before your hearing was damaged. So I hope that helps, Mike. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that. Good question, Mike, and thanks for the answer. Um, Ross on LinkedIn has asked a question about, is there a difference between using headphones and earphones from the perspective of headphones will allow the user to hear sound while blocking out ancillary noise? earphones allow ancillary noise but perhaps with less heat and moisture being trapped and so does that affect does that sort of heat and moisture question come into play from a hearing um noise and sound perspective or just a sort of hygiene uh perspective okay i think uh, i would go back to uh the, sorry to be repetitive but it's it, it i hope it's helpful uh, rather than introducing another uh theme i think the answer to your question is depends so on the tube, I wear these. They're noise cancelling. As you can see, they've got a big pad. And in just even before you turn them on, they probably reduce the noise on the tube by about 10 dB. Now, th that's really good. So suddenly you've gone from early 90s, 92, 94 dB down to 84 and so your listening level is going to be somewhere around the early 90s. So it depends on your environment. If your environment is quiet, I'm in my office in North London at the moment, it's very quiet. I would be quite happy to use earbuds or earpieces here. The problem with earbuds or earpieces is they don't get rid of, so 
problem or advantage, they don't get rid of noise. So if you wear, if you at some point, the next time you're on a tube or a train, you see somebody with earbuds in or earpieces in, the level of sound that they're competing with is a very large part of what's being delivered to them. And so they will have to listen at a higher level. So the answer to the question, I'm afraid, is depends. Noisy environments, over-ear headphones are good because they have passive attenuation, which reduces the level of sound you get at the ear, plus they have the noise cancelling feature. We've done some tests with these. You can listen three to four times as long with these headphones in noise cancelling mode as you can without. So, you know, noise cancelling, very, very effective. As to your point about ear hygiene to do with moisture of earbuds, not my part of ship, sir. I don't really know whether there is any difference. Um, I personally don't like having my ear canal blocked. I don't know about you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's a per matter of personal taste. But, uh, you yeah, know, if it's important, we can certainly go and I can go and ask. A, uh, we have an audiologist on the board of my company. Um, we can certainly go and say to him, is the moisture um, heat issue a big one for earbud users and what are the consequences mm -hmm. we can ask if, if that's important to somebody yeah so i've i've got these which i wear for my sort of webinars and podcasts and so on and then funnily enough when when i'm out and about uh on the tube or whatever i've got my little uh apple things but i but i don't actually listen um i when i'm actually on the tube i turn it off um i don't try and turn it up because i know i just know that's not good for you so i i listen to I use my little earbuds, you know, yeah. to and from the station or whatever. But then if I'm actually on the train, I yeah, I just turn the stuff off because I know I, I never might be able to hear it. Because of the Northern Line, I mean, you know, I, I'm very fond of the tube. I think it's an absolutely amazing system. But because the Northern Line is so noisy, I quite often wear these without any content. So I just have them on noise cancelling, particularly if I'm reading a book because it, it helps me concentrate. Good, uh, good, good tip there. Um, now we're, we're coming up to time. Um, Rosemary's put something in the chat, which I think is a, is a really good question to to end on, uh, which is that she recently left a role and she was trying to get sound to be aware of this issue of sound, but was was struggling. And, and she's asking, um, why is that? And I suppose a supplementary question from me would be, um, you know, concluding this, bringing uh, for, uh, and wrapping this up in the context of of the audience. You know, what can we do? Uh, what would you encourage us to do um, to, to try and, and help you on the mission to to raise awareness among our uh, colleagues? Right. Um, I think I think the issue is the one we touched on before. If there was some obvious product of having overloaded your ears, other than perhaps a little bit of sh threshold shift or a, a, you know a disappearing tinnitus, I mean, my tinnitus came and then disappeared again and I didn't take it seriously because I didn't know enough about it if we're, if there were clear was clear and obvious uh consequences every time you overloaded it I think you know that life would be very different um we have to make this point that hearing damage is a very gradual uh, effect I think we have to make the point is that until you've damaged half of it you probably can't detect it and I think I think we probably have in the work setting, we probably have to get the employees to be aware of the risks and ask their employers what precautions they've taken to look after their hearing while they're at work. So I think in the what you can do, I would really like it if you would follow us on the Make Listening Safe campaign with this logo on things like LinkedIn and Twitter, et cetera. Um, I, 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 do we send this round after? Oh, Christian, I'll give you the links afterwards so people can easily tag yeah, on. Yeah, give, give me the links and then when, yeah. when, when this get post, okay. gets posted up, we'll, we'll put the so, links in and stuff, yeah. So what the, the, this is really helpful because uh, tomorrow I have to write my notes for this, uh, the talk I'm going to do at the launch on the 1st of November. And I think that's the point is we have to get, in an occupational situation, we have to say to the employee, they're your ears. What is your employer done to safeguard them? And are you happy with that? And if you're not, just ask them. It's not 
confrontational it is you know you expect me to operate in this way on this in this call center or deal with customer inquiries or you are happy for me to sit in this open plan office i think open plan offices are really high risk areas because you know people large numbers of people sit there all day on headphones and you know that's what we do so i think that i think the love set the um, make listening safe campaign has a very big part to play in increasing awareness i hope that was helpful good stuff uh, rosemary's put her hand up and that was her question so go on rosemary you yeah, can go come on. in uh, hi rosemary hi can you hear me yep good oh excellent um it, it, it's not so much it, as the, I, the, the company I've just left, and one of the reasons I left is because it was a shambles in terms of health and safety, but I'll, I won't bore you with that stuff. It, the problem was that there are, it's a massive mixed audience. There, there are some Poles, there are some Lithuanians, some Romanians, some, some Welsh, some English, some Scots, you name it. There's almost everybody. It's like United Nations at this particular factory. The decibel testing only revealed it was about 75, so decibels weren't heavy. But the problem was that is rather that they were also wearing their own headphones because they wanted to listen to music. So there was music blaring out on the radios and then there was music that people were listening to in their own ears and trying to get them to understand that they are their ears. And you kind of can't go on doing this because this is going to be a problem if you're going to do this. It, it, it's that message. It, yeah. It's all about their selfless selfishness if you like in as far as they want their own little bubble is actually impacting on everybody else because then the radio has to go up in volume because it's, oh, it just gets it escalates oh How you get you no no sorry rosemary you make a very good point um <laughs> we <laughs> we came across some people working in a i won't say where it is um i, I won't even say what they were making because you'll guess where it was um, and they they were provided with the most fantastic um, hearing safeguarding because the the process they were involved in was very noisy. But then they were wearing their AirPod uh, AirPods underneath their their protection, yeah. and and that that's wrong on so many levels. I mean, one, it's incredibly bad for your hearing. Secondly, you're isolated from your work colleague. This is a, yes. not very dangerous, but what potentially dangerous environment. They would never have heard an alarm because they were playing they were they were isolated from the noise the sound they wanted to hear was an alarm because you do want to hear alarms and they'd isolated themselves and they then bunged up their ears look we it's not actually in that situation you've talked about rosemary it's not actually the employee's choice it's the employer's choice so the employer's if you think about this, the employer has an obligation to make sure that the employee is not exposed above a certain level. What they have done is they have uh, issued hearing protection to, to make sure, and that's great, and everybody's under 75 dBs, but then the employer and the employee has then circumvented that and is probably getting a higher level than, uh, than that, and that is not permitted. In the same way, if you tried to get on a building site saying, you know, you'd modified your, your steel toe cap boots in some way. Yeah. Or you'd, you know, you cut a hole in the top of your hard hat. So it's the it's a tricky one. And, you know, the, the danger is once it becomes custom and practice, it's very difficult to put the genie back in the bottle. But that that scenario sounds like everybody should be told you're not to wear any communications devices under your hearing safeguarding and then they'll go then they'll riot and then they'll say okay you can only wear this one and this one is a is a regulated one and it, and it will protect your hearing um so but it's a it's a very tricky one and that's a real you know practical example of how problems sounds like you're well out of it rosemary and uh, i'm sorry to hear that that's the case yeah it's um yeah, I, I've really enjoyed this, and I think it brings uh, lots of issues to, to light. And it's an it's an example of something a bit like mental health, I guess, where we haven't historically been looking at it carefully enough or talking about it, and therefore we don't have that kind of historic data reference point, do we? So you know, people of a certain age now um, didn't have these 
devices and headphones and all of that stuff when they were young and and so it's kind of a bit of a ticking time bomb uh potentially here so i do think it's really an issue that we should all focus on and and hopefully this conversation has has helped uh so um thanks very much Stephen. really enjoyed it well and thank just, you and uh, thank you to the audience as well it's been very uh, i've enjoyed it very much thank you good and and just uh drawing it to a close then um you mentioned you know following on linkedin and stuff um any 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 other particular uh resources or, or things or calls to action that you'd like people to do um before we before we wrap it up yeah i i think probably the thing to do would be if you can go and find make listening safe campaign uk on linkedin i'm sorry i should have put it and dropped it in the chat or something please put it please uh follow us on there uh likewise on twitter um and uh keep your eyes open for the launch on the first of um november it's an evening event so most of the news will come out after that we are going to record it if you have a particular wish to attend please let me know and i'll see if we've got a few tickets available um you can get at me so stephen wheatley on limit on uh, linkedin um there's a picture of me wearing a pair of headphones unsurprisingly um please just message me uh, a, a connection request and then you know i'll give you an email address and you can you can bid for some tickets but yeah i really would appreciate your support on this and you know this is there's no silver bullet here kids we're not going to be able to solve this in one go yeah. we will need to keep going at it relentlessly and you know we need to start and and we will well we've been at it for 13 years we've had some success um, but I, I think this uh, Make Listening Safe campaign here and overseas will be a, a major step forward. But thank you again for, your, for attendance and your excellent questions. It's been very enjoyable. Thank you. Good stuff. And um, yeah, thanks everybody for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you on another safety roundtable in a couple of weeks. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Thanks for joining us on the Safety and Risk Success podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit follow and do share on social media. Does anyone you know spring to mind as a great guest, even yourself? If so, please contact us on podcast at slipsafety.co.uk. See you next week for another episode.